Y'all, thank you for joining us again. Uh, we have Holly May is signing today, assisted by Leslie Klepik over there. We thank you for being here. Also, um, Chaplain John Denny, if you please. Thank you, Governor. Victor Frankel wrote, the last of human freedoms is the ability to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances. If you would, please pray with me. Gracious Lord, during this time of uncertainty, help us to choose to have an attitude of thankfulness and gratitude. Your word says for us to give thanks in all circumstances, not just in good times, but in rough times as well. Help us, O oh God, to seek out the good. Help us to choose to be grateful, even when the spirit of grumbling is upon us. Lord, I pray for your comfort for the families who have been affected by this virus and help us to stay steadfast and united in our support of each other. We humble, humbly ask this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I, again, I thank you for being here. I am, am happy to report that South Carolina is making great progress. Uh, we are coming together, working together uh, in a way that, that we, we see in these emergency situations, and it's comforting to see it happening again with, with this unprecedented situation and unprecedented emergency. I have a, a progress report and an update in a number of areas. <clears throat> you remember we asked the state employees to work at home according to their supervisor's discretion. We now have working from home and state employees 15,238. Working as normal in the office, we have 15,812. It's almost 50-50. We are hoping that we can move that 50-50 number up to 75% working at home in the next two weeks or so. Uh, and our, we urge our private employers also to follow this example to the extent that they can because we know that this makes a difference. It's the closeness and the, the inevitabilities of contact on surfaces and hands and things as well as coughing and sneezing that make this virus so dangerous. All plans and contingencies are on the table. We're not ruling anything in except those we've already ruled in. We're not ruling anything out. Uh, and that includes, as been asked by many, shelter in place, which is a stay home shelter in place order, which we have not, not issued. And that is a drastic action, and we all hope that that will not be necessary. And many South Carolinians are taking precautions that will render that unnecessary. They're staying home, they're using good personal hygiene, they're washing their hands, they're cleaning surfaces, they're not touching their nose and mouth and their eyes to contact and spread the disease, and they are using common sense. I know it's, it's hard to not touch things and then touch your, your face, touch your eyes, nose, and mouth, which of course leads to the respiratory part of this. It's hard to do that. That's why you must keep washing your hands all day long. And that's why it's important to stay away, keep that social distance from others so that you're not spreading things by contact and also by sneezing and coughing. So for all those who are out there working so hard, to see that our people are safe, I want, on behalf of all the rest of us, I want to say thank you very much. We appreciate it and urge you to continue to do it, but to do it with more vigor and attempt to accept, to set as good an example and as an obvious example as you can for all of our federal citizens, our, our common citizens, our friends and our neighbors. To uh, many people are not using the common sense now you see, I'm I'm rubbing right, not my eye, but right under under my eye. That is, uh, and I've just washed my hands. So there's nothing on my hands because I washed them in, in for almost a minute, a minute ago. That's about the only way you ought to be touching your face. But there are a lot of people that, that are not doing that. And those are the simple things. There are also there are a lot of people that are congregating. There are a lot of people 
you go into the beaches in big crowds, a lot of people going into the parking lots, a lot of people going at the, the shopping centers and things like that and congregating, and that, that opens up all kinds of opportunities for the spread of this virus. And that will, that, that lack of discipline, that lack of consideration, lack of forethought and lack of of consciousness about what is going on is what will result in the spread of this virus. So I want to ask everyone to redouble their efforts to see that we do not jam people together. We don't have groups, whether it's spontaneous or planned, and not to, not to put others in that immediate contact that, that results in this infection. That is how it is spread by touching each other, touching one's stuff, and then going to your hands with your nose, mouth, and your eyes. So I'm issuing another executive order under this state of emergency, and it is this, to reinforce this point and to allow us to take official action. <clears throat> there is a state statute, and it reads and allows this, and I want to make everyone aware now. I'm hereby authorizing, ordering, and directing directing any and all law enforcement officers of the state or any political subdivision thereof in accordance with the South Carolina Code of Laws and other applicable law to prohibit or disperse any congregation or gathering of people unless authorized in their homes in groups of three or more if the law enforcement officials determine in their discretion that such gathering or congregation in people poses or could pose a threat to public health. Now this is statutory authority our law enforcement officers have. It is similar, you could say, to a public nuisance statute, which is a, is a civil statute, but this is a criminal statute and it's a misdemeanor. And this would apply to a lot of things. It would apply to parties on the beach, to boisterous gatherings or concerts, to spontaneous gatherings or unruly gatherings in shopping centers, parking lots. Those are the kinds of things, and we have all seen them. What it does not apply to, what it is not intended to apply to, is, is law-abiding businesses or employers. It's difficult to draw the line but we know it when we see it. And law, law officers have this authority by state law and under this state of emergency, I'm asking them to implement it vigorously according to their discretion. We must not have these sorts of gatherings that are invitations for infection. I want to thank some people who have done a lot of great work. We've asked for the contractors and construction companies to go through their materials and see if they are personal protective equipment that could be given, donated to the hospitals and others, and they have come forward in a remarkable fashion. And these include Sloan Construction Company, Lineberger Construction, PCL Constructors, Hood Construction, DR Horton, Professional Building Supply, Builders First Source, and I know there are others that are coming in as well, and we appreciate that very much. That is the South Carolina spirit that is so alive and well in this emergency as well as when we have others like hurricanes and floods. It's neighbors helping neighbors. Here's some facts. According to the South Carolina Medical Association, the South Carolina and the South Carolina Hospital Association, you recall we asked to get the, move those people out, put off for elective uh, surgery uh, if, if it's, it's not urgent to go ahead and put that off to leave the beds available for those who may be coming in as a result of the virus. Well, today there are 50 six percent more vacant hospital beds today than were when I asked the hospital to suspend those elective procedures last Tuesday afternoon. What that means is that there are 1,819 more beds available to handle that than there were six days ago. And we're also working with the National Guard with uh, Fort Jackson, General Beagle, with others to uh, find places that we can use 
as an overflow for the hospitals in order to bring the virus patients that need isolation into the, the hospitals. Last week, I asked the grocery stores, pharmacies, and retailers to set aside special senior hours so our senior citizens could go in without the rush of other, other customers and buy their necessary items and groceries and things that they need. Again, the spirit of South Carolina is evident and so far, and this is, this, the list is growing, we've had responses of setting aside senior times for shopping from the following, Aldi, Bilo, Costco, Harris Teeter, Ingalls, Kroger, Lowe's Food, Publix, Target, Walgreens, Walmart, W. Lee Flowers, and Food Lion. That is a remarkable response in South Carolina to that request. Also, another note, 91 Small Business Administration loan applications have been made by South Carolinians since the state was approved three days ago, and our entire state has been approved for these Small Business Administration loans. And I want to say again, finally, to all the citizens of South Carolina, if you don't need to be in a public place, if you don't need to be out, then don't go out. This is a good time to stay home. There are a lot of things we all need to do at, at home, whether it's cleaning out the garage, reading a book, fixing something. There must be a thousand and one things that we're all always looking for some time to do. Well, time has arrived. This is a good time to stay home if you can. Don't be in a public place because you may be, we must all assume that we have the virus and we must all assume that the people we're talking to have the virus. If we all take those kind of precautions, then chances are that virus is not going to spread, at least on that event there. We urge everyone, remember, wash your hands. Keep your hands away from your eyes, your nose, your mouth, because you may be bringing something from, that you contacted on a table or a desk or a steering wheel or a doorknob that somebody touched the day before and you scratch your eye and there you go. You're subject to that infection because it's a strong virus and it lasts a long time, particularly on steel and plastic and things like that. Prevent this spread. Don't hoard supplies. There are plenty of, supply, plenty of food, plenty of things coming to the grocery stores. They, they will be open. There's no need to hoard supplies. And always follow the information of the official sources only. There are a lot of rumors. You, you wouldn't believe some of the rumors that, that we hear. I don't know where these rumors come from, but they, some of them are just as wild as they can be. But follow the official sources. Get your information from the official sources and, and not, not from any place else. And that's one reason we're having this press conference. It's one reason we send out as much information as, as we can in order to provide, to answer the questions of the people. And I know DHEC and other institutions are doing the same thing. So I want to thank the citizens for working so hard. I want to urge those that are, that are not yet, don't seem to have a grip on how serious this is, urge them to think it over and be courteous, be safe, and, and be, and let's don't be sorry, let's be safe. Dr. Bell of DHEC, if you please. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. As of today, South Carolina has confirmed cases of COVID-19 in 34 counties across the state. The counts per county are posted on our website and are updated daily. To date, we have reported receiving 295 confirmed cases from our public health laboratory and private laboratories, and our public health laboratory has performed 2,239 tests, of which 2,012 have been positive, or approximately 10%. Sadly, this now includes five reported deaths of patients who had previous, previously been reported to us as being diagnosed with COVID-19. Two of these cases were reported earlier today. Each of these patients were elderly and had underlying conditions prior to testing positive for COVID-19. On behalf of all South Carolinians, we want to express our deepest sympathy to the family and loved ones of these patients. This loss of these fellow South Carolinians is a reminder of the importance of taking precautions to protect those at highest risk, like the elderly and people with serious underlying conditions. 
I would now like to provide a situational update of the status of COVID-19 in the United States and here in South Carolina. And according to the CDC, the United States is now in the initiation phase of a pandemic. This is based on a pandemic interval framework, which describes the progression of pandemics in six intervals or phases. The duration of each phase might vary depending on the type of the virus and the public health response. Different parts of the country are currently seeing different levels of COVID-19 transmission. Nationally, the U.S. is currently on the initiation phase, but states where community spread is occurring are in the acceleration phase. This would include South Carolina. The acceleration phase means the need for the transition from contact investigations of each individual to prioritized investigations around those who are at highest risk of being exposed, and a broader community-focused measures as what we are doing now. Realizing that spread is occurring, we encourage the public to focus on things that each of us can do to limit the spread of illness. This includes washing your hands and covering your mouth when you cough, avoiding groups, and especially staying home if you are ill. As the lead public health agency in South Carolina, one of DHEC's primary missions is to protect and promote the health of the public. One critical activity that helps us carry out that mission is conducting surveillance of selected infectious diseases. And the principles of disease surveillance are to collect information about where diseases are occurring, to analyze the data so that we can understand who is being affected, and then to interpret and share information that prevents the spread of disease. We understand the increasing interest in every detail of cases in each community, but I believe that the desire for this information on an individual basis has led to complacency in areas where we don't have information about disease being spread. It gives a false sense of security to rely on information from individuals within your community when what is recommended is that Follow the guidance that has been provided regardless of whether or not you know cases are in your community or in your specific neighborhood. It is suggested that many did not take seriously the measures that had previously been recommended because cases had not been identified in their communities and this is why spread continues to occur. If we change those behaviors, we can slow the spread and stop transmission. As I've stated previously, this will be an extended response, and we want people to be prepared for more cases to occur and to continue to listen to and follow the recommendations from public health officials. We recognize the hardship that many South Carolinians are facing, and it is important for all of us to protect our health, but also our mental health and our emotional health during this time. Remember that everyone copes with stress differently. And to ensure that you protect your mental and emotional health, it's important to take breaks while many are in isolation and we are practicing social distancing. But particularly take breaks from watching, reading, and continuously listening to news reports about COVID-19 and social media. Hearing about COVID-19 continuously is a stress-inducing event. So we encourage to take breaks from that kind of information. Take care of your body, eat healthy, balanced meals, exercise regularly, get plenty of sleep, and avoid alcohol and drugs. Make time to unwind and participate in activities that you enjoy, and, con and connect with others. Talk with people you trust about your concerns and how they were feeling on the phone and through responsible social media. We tend to spend a lot of time interacting with others, and that understandably raises concerns about what level of caution we should take to do necessary activities. Everyone should continue to monitor for symptoms and still practice social distancing. Avoid touching frequently touched surfaces and items like doorknobs and rails, and remember to regularly wash your hands, as always after being in public places, but also remember that the disease is most commonly spread by respiratory droplets that are coughed or sneezed 
by direct contact with people who have signs of illness. People with signs of illness must stay at home and avoid public gatherings. Those who are charged with caring for a family member, friend, or neighbor who is at greater risk for becoming ill are asked to follow information provided by the CDC and by DHEC to safely provide this care at home. This continues to be an emerging and rapidly evolving situation, and DHEC will provide updated information as it becomes available, and will continue to provide updates on our webpage at scdhec.gov forward slash COVID-19. Thank you, and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Dr. Bell? You were just talking about uh, transitioning from, you know, just looking at the, the current contact tracing to higher priority areas, people that are higher at risk. When you look at those 100 new cases that just came out, can you tell us maybe where you're focusing those priorities right now or overall where your priorities are when we're looking at these new cases? Yes, we are continuing to focus on known close contacts of those individuals. All the positive cases reported to DHEC are interviewed and we try and identify the close contacts. We don't focus as much on, on uh, public settings where those individuals have been because we don't consider everyone in those public settings to be close contacts. We also focus on um, cases in institutions or settings like nursing homes, uh, the possibility in a child care center, and we focus on populations of individuals who could be at increased risk, like specifically the elderly. Dr. Bell, what was the number total again? Is it 295 or 298? The total number of cases that uh, we are reporting now is 298 confirmed cases. Dr. Bell, I know you said we are in the acceleration phase of the pandemic. What really does that mean, I guess, and then where's the next step? The acceleration phase means that as cases increase, it is no longer feasible to do individual contact investigations for every single case. And that is when we begin to focus more on community measures, social distancing, school closures, and things like that. Also in the acceleration phase, we may no longer seek to test every single person. We will focus more on a sampling in the population to make sure that we still have an, uh, a reasonable picture of disease transmission in communities without necessarily attempting to identify every single case. And this is particularly important if um, laboratory testing becomes uh, compromised during some shortages, and we would therefore focus on testing for uh, people who are more seriously ill in hospitals and um, healthcare providers and others who have close contacts with those cases. Next question. Director Toomey, um, some of the stuff that has come from the national stockpile was expired. Has that been distributed and to where? question is the distribution from the national stockpile, some of the items had been expired and where, where was it distributed? Uh, we received this shipment uh, last week and distributed it to 46 counties and also to the Catawba Nation. And we distributed it based on a population ratio. So the supplies that we received from the uh, national stockpile was distributed out to all 46 counties. What about the expired stuff? Was it specifically going to certain types of facilities or not? It, all of the materials had been given an extended warranty by the federal government and their distribution. And uh, that information was shared with each of the receiving sites. So the federal government said while its items had expired, they still had a useful life. When we look at that allotment, how much of our entire allotment have we received and what can we expect in the coming weeks? They really, the question was how much of the allotment did we receive and how much more might we receive, paraphrasing. The allotment was, and I gave those numbers, and I don't have the numbers with me, but we received approximately, well, I don't want to say approximately, we received the distribution. We have been informed that they are shipping a second uh, uh, shipment to us that we expect it to receive, receive it sometime this week. We will use a similar methodology and where in the previous distribution we withheld 10% for emergency issues, we, will, we plan on distributing 100% of the materials that we receive in the second shipment.
Uh, we do not know if there's a third or fourth shipment, but we are pleased to know that we're receiving a second shipment so close because all providers are still uh, running low of supplies. You specifically asked about ventilator machines. Have you asked or received uh, ventilator machines from the national stockpile, and then I guess more broadly, what is the current supply and demand uh, for ventilator machines? Question is about ventilator machines, and have we received or requested any from the national stockpile? I do not know if they have ventilator machines in their stockpile or not, so I'll look into that question. But the second one is what is our supply? Um, we asked the hospitals yesterday to give us an inventory and a Dalton Peds, well, we have 1,054 ventilators as a, um, a number within the state. That's not counting neonatal ventilators for neonatal purposes only. And it also does not count 104 for transport or portable ones. So we have about 1,160 ventilators in the state in hospitals. Governor, Next we've, uh, we've received some comments from people, our viewers, saying that they're having a hard time actually applying for unemployment. Is there anything being done to ease that? We've heard that the site is crashing and that they're having issues along those lines. Uh, yes, that uh, steps are being taken to, to ease that. Uh, Mr. Elsie is not here today, but uh, we are, are well aware of, of the interest in that site and, uh, and it ought to be running fine right now but we're going to keep watching that and try to find every way we can to be sure that people can can not only uh, apply but as you know there are a number of the employers are applying for the for their employees which saves about a week uh, worth of time and going back and forth to, to get the get the checks but we're watching it closely and doing all we can to see that we don't have any any bottlenecks in that well speaking of those employees uh, we're also hearing from folks who are unfortunately having to live in hotels in the first place and now they don't have a job to be able to pay the rent for the hotels are you guys is there anything specifically targeted to try to help those folks there out? is uh, the, the this uh, the small business uh, the loans are, are one of those but also there's uh, legislation right now pending in Congress. Uh, you may have heard it's in being debated uh, vigorously in the last few days that will address exactly that. And we are hoping that that uh, legislation will pass quickly. And if I could ask just one more. Sure. Uh, when, you, when you issued your order today limiting crowd size to three people or more to try to disperse these large crowds like what we are seeing on the beaches, how is that different from what you proclaimed Friday on Twitter, trying to get SLED and everybody to go ahead and Well, this was, I announced the, the presence of that law then. This is, I'm asking law enforcement officers to, to be, be sure they understand that they, they can implement that and the, the ramifications of it, but also wanted to be sure they understood what it is not intended to apply to. And that's such things as law-abiding businesses and other things, but as in all laws, you cannot cover every possible situation in a list. So this is, as I said, it's sort of like the public nuisance law, which is a civil proceeding, except this is a criminal one that is available during states of emergency like this one. But again, it requires discretion, it requires common sense. And the, the, the biggest place where we're missing some common sense these days is, is not among law enforcement, but among our own citizens who are, are for whatever reason, are not taking the steps to see that this virus does not spread. And that's why I emphasize, follow the rules, be a good neighbor, don't, don't touch things and then touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. Don't sneeze on people. If you're sick, stay home. Uh, look in on, your, on, on your, your, your senior neighbors. Uh, there's a wealth of information on the websites of DHIC and, and all the others about the, what is available to help people. But the, the, the main line of defense is, is in every single person, and that is what they contact, what they com come into contact with, what they do with their hands. And if, if we can master that and, and have a, a real compliance with those very commonsensical public health rules, that would be an enormous help in this virus. I guess my main question really is just that when you, you're limiting it to three people, so I mean... No, I'm not, the, the, the law, no, the law, the statute has been on the books for many years. It says three or more is what it applies to. And it, but it ex excludes homes. 
but the purpose of it is is, is not for law-abiding businesses and things of that nature, but those type of spontaneous and otherwise events that I described. Yes, sir, sir, that's what I meant. Sorry, apologies. But uh, when you, that small number, though, still three or more, is like, that's a very low bar. I mean, I saw a family of three out and about on their bikes. That's all I'm just wondering is somebody out there who's hearing something like this. Well, that's, 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 why, I, that's why I say that if you, we have to use a little bit of common sense. And a, a, a mama and daddy and two children walking a, a, along the, the beach or the sidewalk is not what a criminal law is aimed for. In fact, that's a very good thing as long as they uh, go back home and stay away from crowds themselves. But again, every law requires common sense. And we have, we probably have the best law enforcement in the United States right here in South Carolina. And it's one thing they've got plenty of is common sense and a lot of experience. Governor McMaster, yes, um, I was wondering, so do you know, if, is there a way that we can speak to the number? I know a lot of people have complacency with children because there's been kind of the idea that children don't carry the virus or aren't affected by the virus as much. Is there any way to speak to that in our state? Do we have a number on much younger people getting the virus? Sure. So what we know about the virus is that the majority of people who are more um, severely ill are above the age of 65. That doesn't mean that they have a greater chance of being exposed, it just means that they have more serious complications. Now anyone in any age group can be affected and we see smaller numbers in younger age groups who are actually hospitalized. But we do know that um, any age group, um, any individual in any age group, if exposed to someone who's ill, can become ill. Just to clarify, when you say the acceleration phase, is that the start of our surge that some would say, or our spike? Is that safe to call those two, or is it separate, would you say? Well, if you could picture in your mind a sort of a bell-shaped curve, um, we would be on the front end of the, 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 the steep side of that curve. So we've transitioned to a, a flatter, slower uprise to a more rapid peak. Now, the um, you know how rapidly that increase occurs depends on how effective our measures are for community mitigation strategies. And so to be on that uh, more rapid upslope is what we mean by the acceleration phase, and that is defined by ongoing transmission in, in communities in our state. Dr. Bell, yes. yeah, over here. Yes, with, thank you, sir. Uh, with 31 cases in Greenville County, are those all in one part of the county, or where are most of those cases isolated? So we report counts at the county level. And as, as I explained earlier, by zeroing down on cases within a county tends to give people a false sense of security. So understanding a specific address or a specific neighborhood doesn't really help for our disease control measures because it can lead to the assumption that people are not traveling from those neighborhoods or to other counties. And so the expectation to have that really specific information, I believe, has led to complacency in other communities because they think, if it's not in my neighborhood, then I don't have to follow the expected measures. And people continue to congregate because they have a false sense of security that if their specific neighborhood is not identified, then they don't change their behavior. That doesn't help us with public health um, measures to prevent disease, and that's why we are in a community mitigation phase, that for communities overall, we expect everyone to comply with the messages that we've been giving all along, even before cases occurred in those communities. With also the front part of that acceleration, should we not be more aggressive with having people to shelter in place, or when will we get to that? Well, the measures remain the same. It's what we have said uh, from the beginning. It's just that um, we know that people haven't necessarily been following those measures. So uh, with school closures and the recommendation for people to stay home if they're ill and to not congregate, those, ki those kinds of behaviors continued. It, it is a behavior change that we need. It's not a change in the, the guidance that we have given all along. And can we confirm the baby tested positive from Lexington? We have confirmed that, um, that an infant has tested positive in South Carolina. And also a question real quickly for the governor. I noticed several people were on <clears throat> transportation such as buses. Have anything come down the pipe to deal with the social distancing in that aspect? 
I'm sorry. Could you? Is that for me? Would you? Yeah, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? I noticed uh, several people riding buses, obviously needing to get to work and other places, but there were more than a few people on the bus. So, have we have anything to come kind of deal with that social distancing? So, social distancing as much as possible. So, the, we want people to apply social social distancing for voluntary activities. If people have to get to work and they have to use public transportation, they must continue to do that, but there are measures that they can take to prevent touching surfaces, spacing yourself out when you're on public transportation. So by minimizing unnecessary activities, we can allow people to maintain required activities. I have a question for Superintendent Spearman. Um, right now, do we know, is there any thought to pushing school back further and also with the students who are currently doing the e-learning, will they have to repeat the grade that they're in now or what's the <laughs> process on that? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, first of all, you know that the governor gave an executive order. Our schools are closed till the end of the month. That's Tuesday, a week from tomorrow. We're in conversations and realize that we will probably have to make uh, another statement about school closure and we'll do that at the appropriate time to give folks lead time to get prepared. We are in conversations all, all day today. I've been on the phone meeting with superintendents, instructional leaders, and we anticipate that this week we will be coming out with an action plan on things like how are we going to handle graduation. Uh, you know we announced today that we will suspend all spring testing, and that also includes testing like the end of course tests that students take when they're in high school on biology, history. So all of those uh, announcements are on our website. We're doing everything we possibly can to make this as smooth as possible uh, with our students and our faculty and our teachers uh, at at the top of the priority list. Would that be so, AP testing as well? Pardon? Would that be AP testing as well? The AP testing is done by the College Board, and they made an announcement on Friday on how they anticipate handling AP testing. We're working with our vendors, not only for AP, but also uh, with ACT. Those tests, which will help seniors and juniors be ready for college, we're going to do everything we possibly can to have those tests administered. Uh, we'll have to work with the vendor companies and the students may have to take the test at home. We're working those details out now, but that's a top priority for us to do everything possible for seniors and juniors to get them ready to go on to the next phase after high school. Next question. Yes, sir. Governor McMaster, for people who have taken the coronavirus test and are waiting the results back, what do you recommend they do when they when they're waiting for the results to come back? When there's Dr. Bell, um, if a healthcare provider has decided that a test is indicated, then we ask those individuals to to act as though they uh, have the illness, that they are to stay in isolation until their test result comes back. And if it's negative, then those measures can be um, suspended. But uh, they're expected to um, to stay in isolation, avoid contact with others because they they are considered to be a, a possible case. Next question. Yes, sir. In the back. Uh, for Dr. Toomey, you mentioned the amount of ventilators in the state. Is there an update on the availability and what categories the hospital is reporting? Not sure of your second part of your question. The, uh, there's about 1,148 ventilators in the state. We do not have what is the current number being utilized. Uh, we are expecting the federal government to come out with additional questions. So we have not sent that question back out to the hospitals. They do report every six hours the number of beds that they have both occupied and then we know what their census number is. But we do not know the number being utilized at this point in time. With the, stockpile, Next question. with the stockpile you're waiting, you said there's another shipment coming in. Are we just taking whatever they send us? Are we able to request specific things? The stockpile has specific things. So we it's not a shopping cart. And so they're sending us what they have stockpiled and they distribute based upon the population of the state. So we get what they send us. Testing. Can you give us an update on how testing is going in South Carolina, especially when we look at this jump in 100 cases, 103 cases? Is that a result of more testing coming online, or uh, just kind of what's the capacity right now, and we're still seeing those swap shortages? 
so the uh, capacity and the number. So there's a there's a not a complicated, but there's a convoluted answer to that. We reported out yesterday 22 cases, 22 positives, um, and we reported out 103 today. Part of that dramatic increase was a shortage of testing material that the public health lab had on f Saturday. So we had to delay the run of Saturday tests. The 22 were reported out all from private labs. So the report out from today, which was yesterday's run, we ran two batches yesterday that reflected the delay and we got a shipment in of the reagent late Saturday afternoon. So we were able to batch and run both groups on Sunday, thus the larger number reporting out today. Um, we are seeing a continued increase in the number of tests that we are running. Um, I think Dr. Bell said that we've had total number of tests run is 2239. So we are now doing 200, 300 or so tests a day. Our capacity of testing is over a thousand, probably closer to 1,500, if we had all of the reagents that we need. We're getting shipments of the reagent in every couple of days. So we do not have any ever a large stockpile, uh, but we are seeing more and more labs coming on, and some of those labs are going to be using different materials to run their tests. So the capacity in the state is going to ramp up over the, over the near future. We have been able to run every test that has come to us and our turnaround, we receive it by midday and our results are usually by that night which we pour out the next day. Have the standards for how you, or who's getting the test, has that changed at all given that we're in the new acceleration phase? I know you, uh, we heard you say that we're not necessarily testing everyone who looks like they have the symptoms or did I hear that incorrectly? Well, no, we're, we're currently uh, encouraging providers to continue to test those who present with the symptoms suggestive of the disease. We're also strongly encouraging providers and others not to seek testing for individuals who do not have symptoms. That can preserve the test. Um, depending on testing availability here and nationally, we may move to a practice of preserving testing for those who are more seriously ill in a hospital setting or for healthcare providers. At this time, we're continuing to test those with symptoms of illness. Dr. Bell, the two tests that you announced today, were those previously known cases? Yes. Okay. If there are South Carolina residents and Clemson students stuck in Peru, are we working to get them home? Or can you all give us any update on what's happening with them? I know efforts are underway. I don't have the details. I don't have that information. We don't have any details. Of My other question um, from the viewers, beauty salons, nail salons, barber shops, and people walking in the park. Can somebody address that? I'm just asking you viewer questions. Dr. Bell. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty salon and barber shop question is a frequent one. And we're asking people to consider the type of close contact they're having when they're getting those services and whether or not those services are um, optional and to make the best decisions about uh, social distancing. Is yes. there a question about the symptoms, uh, just following up on that? We've heard from some people who have said they uh, have lost a sense of smell or lost a sense of taste. There was an article in the New York Times this morning that that could actually be a symptom of the virus, but some people have said that when they've reported that as a symptom, to NUSC or to Prisma that they've been told that that is not uh, enough to, to, to get a test. Um, is that a symptom that you would uh, view as, as a potential indicator? And if not, why not? Well, we, we know that the, the disease presentation can be a spectrum of symptoms, a variety of symptoms. But in order to do um, sort of mass screening, if you will, we focus on the most commonly associated symptoms with the illness, which are fever, a cough, shortness of breath. Um, there can be as uh, other associated symptoms on the individual basis, muscle aches, um, not familiar with the loss of taste or smell. But uh, to make the most appropriate use of the test, 
we should focus on the most clinically consistent signs and symptoms when we make that test. But again, it's up to the discretion of the healthcare provider if those if, uh, unusual symptoms are present with more common, commonly expected symptoms, then it's their decision to test. One Do more have, question. Do we have a projection one, of, of how many South Carolinians may end up having this in a timeline, maybe by next month or a month after that? Do we have any type of projection as to how many people may be affected by this? We are working on those projections. We're working with uh, multiple experts uh, that have been uh, at the USC School of Public Health. Um, McLeod has a physician that is involved with it. DHEC has our planning. EMD has its group. The South Carolina National Guard, we actually convened a group yesterday to start doing that and the first report draft report of that group is tomorrow. So we are preparing projections. We're not going to release those projections, but that's a very important process for us to go through to look at the potential. And again, as you do for any projections or feasibility or estimates, it is based on historical, based on data from other countries, based on data from states within the United States to try to project what might be the course of growth of positive cases here. Uh, part of that is looking at a uh, the age groups by county and stuff. So we're going to try to make it um, uh, quicker and simpler than an academic exercise, but we want to make sure we deal with the academic details of it so that we have a good basis for those projections. So I would expect we'll have those in, within the next week. Governor, can you please speak to the number of people, the three or more or uh, less, because people are confused about whether or not a business like a daycare center can have more than three people. Can you just please talk about the three people, where that is appropriate, and right. talk about That will be at the discretion of law enforcement. This is an old law that is activated in times of a, a declaration of emergency when this is. This is not intended to apply to lawful businesses and those kind of things, but rather to gatherings of crowds, whether spontaneous or otherwise. We've had crowds gather at the beaches, we've had crowds gather on sandbars, we've had crowds in parking lots and all sorts of things. This is in the decision of law enforcement. If they believe that that is a, a, a threat in this situation, then they are authorized by that statute to order that crowd to disperse. So right now, how many people do you recommend? Is it still the 50 or the 10 that the president no, this is, the, well, the, the, num I mean the, the numbers, can, there are all sorts of different numbers, but this, this statute, which is an old statute, is specifically says three or more, and that is what law enforcement across the state, any officer, is authorized to use his or her discretion in dispersing if they believe it to be necessary. Well, this applies to, to weddings or funerals or anything like that. We just got a question about that. Just want to clarify yeah. for you. That kind of spontaneous. Or it's, it's a plan of this, this is this, this is a this is a remember this is a law enforcement measure, and I'll say again, it is is designed for the, the, the kinds of crowds that are often are boisterous, often are large, often sometimes spontaneous. We've seen them at the beaches. We've seen them on some of the islands uh, on the on the coast. And every now and then you, you see them in parking lots of places. It's those kind of events. It is, it is not, the statute does not contemplate, although it does not specifically rule anything in or anything out, and that is on purpose to give the law enforcement authorities the ability to make the proper decision. And the, the number three, I presume, was uh, selected because it was a, it seemed like a, 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 to have a, not too high a number, but to have a, law, a, a lower number. Uh, it does not apply to homes, the statute specifically says so. Uh, but it was to give the law enforcement discretion, and that's what we're asking law enforcement to use in this case. You got to use common sense, every law contemplates some amount of common sense, particularly when you're dealing with a category or a, 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 a term that is very flexible. I know you said nothing's off the table. Will you close beaches if it comes to that? As I've said, nothing is, is off the table. Uh, we are taking the steps that we believe are necessary at the time. They're necessary to stay ahead. We have plans with a variety of steps and options, 
and we are taking them based on the data, based on the science, based on the recommendations and insights of the professionals. We thank you very much. We'll keep you informed, and we appreciate you coming.